good morning, everybody. Happy Resurrection Day. Uh, it's one of our favorite, if not their favorite, holiday we have. Because without the resurrection, we have nothing to celebrate. We have nothing to live for. And this is everything. This is the cornerstone of everything that we believe in, uh, stand for, um, live for. So happy Resurrection Day to you. Um, you know, uh, in one sense of the word, it's hard to preach an Easter message. In one sense of the word, because we... We teach Easter all the time. <laughs> we teach the resurrection all the time. Uh, the resurrection is included in every message we teach. Uh, we're, uh, we're just, I mean, it's the foundation. Uh, without the resurrection, we are of all men most miserable. Uh, and so we have victory. Paul says in Ephesians that we were born into victory. We start from the place of victory because of the cross, because of the resurrection. And so he was raised for our justification, it says in Romans 4.25. But in uh, light of, uh, uh, of Easter Sunday, uh, Resurrection Day, I uh, was like, do I do a uh, typical Easter message, or like we almost always do every week, like I just said, or do I continue with our, continue, our series uh, being established in this piece, uh, which I believe is very timely for uh, the day and hour we live in. And I... The, 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 by prayer and whatever, I felt like let's do both because uh, I'm going to continue on with uh, I think this is part three of our series of being established in this piece. I think I only have one more series lesson next week, and then I'm going to do a new series on the spirit of joy, which goes hand in hand with this piece. But uh, we'll talk more about that as we get closer with that. But peace, but peace, I can tie the peace right into the resurrection Sunday. And actually, if, if even now, in, 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 in my notes, looking to rebuild my notes for uh, this part, or this section in our series, it fits right in, and if my, the verses were already there. So God already knew uh, that this was going to be Easter resurrection morning already. So anyway, hopefully that makes sense. We're going to continue with our series, but it's also going to be an Easter message all the same. So, um, so with that, without further ado, before we get into the message, though, real quick, there's a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, we will have our live stream this afternoon at 6 o'clock, this afternoon, evening, uh, your interpretation of that. Uh, but at 6 o'clock, we'll have live stream right here on Facebook. Uh, we'll, be getting, uh, we'll be going through Andrew Walmack's book, Don't Limit God. We had about 60 viewers last week uh, from different countries all over the world, including right here in our own backyard. <clears throat> so we encourage you, if you are available at 6 o'clock, to watch this live stream. Of course, there will be live stream on Facebook, so it will be on our timeline. Uh, and then also, we also, like we'll do it again this week, we'll, we uploaded last week's session onto our website. All of our teachings, including now, uh, I don't want to God uh, serious to this uh, whole uh, uh, epidemic that we're going through, uh, of being quarantined, uh, I'm, I'm also uh, downloading those videos on our website. Our website is iHouseDiscipleship.org. So you can hear all of our messages, today's messages, uh, even Sunday morning. Sunday morning messages are on there. We have a live stream page. We don't live stream directly to that page because we don't have all the equipment yet. We need about $2,700 to, to uh, finalize that bill. We're in phase three to get everything we need for that. And then we can live stream right to our, our Facebook page. Um, but that being said, on our, our live stream page, we have our worship. Uh, as you notice, we start we start our services at 10:30, but we don't start live streaming until 11 about 11, about this time, about between 11 and 11:15. And the reason for that is because we don't have a live worship team, and it's against copyright laws. And Facebook and YouTube will bump, will bump us off if we live stream recorded music. And so we, but we do put our playlist to Spotify on our live stream page, and I update that every Sunday morning. And I, it's already on there for today for today's service. So the worship is on there, plus after today, this afternoon, I will have uploaded today's message on there as well. On our website, again, lighthousediscipleship.org, we also have free Bible classes. They're free. Registration's free. You just register. I'll send you back an email with the universal password that we all use uh, for phase one classes, until you, uh, and, and then you'll just follow the instructions there. But we have a lot of classes. Right now, a lot of people have a lot of time. Uh, it's at your own leisure. Uh, we just ask that you uh, have a session report after every session just to, just to communicate with us, just to connect with us. 
uh, and how you liked it, what you liked, if you have any questions, whatnot. So it's free, and on our, again, it's on our website at lighthousediscipleship.org, and so we encourage you to uh, participate in that. Anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the message this morning, uh, being established in his peace. Go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles this morning, if you have them, or uh, your technical device, whatever you're using at home or wherever you may be. Um, uh, let's go ahead and go to 2 Peter chapter 1. That's kind of been our key verse so far in this series. In 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, we'll begin from verse 2. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Verse 4. By which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. There's a lot here. I've spoken on this the last two weeks. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this here as we just kind of jump off uh, or uh, get started here this morning. But it says, Paul, Peter, through Peter, God saying, Grace and peace will be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. As, and it goes on to say in verse 3 that he has already given us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. So if we want grace, and we're talking about peace, if we want peace to be multiplied to us, then we need to know God. We need to know Jesus. We need to have a relationship with Him. We need to have, you can say this word know out, and it means intimacy. It means experiencing God. And we need to know God, by which He has given us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these promises, we may be partakers of the divine nature. The divine nature, I believe, is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, etc. God is peace. That's His nature. And I, I can be partakers of His nature and not be, partake, not be partakers of the corruption that's in this world. This world has a lust to be stress. stress. Can you agree with me on that? That this world is is destined, is, is lusting to be stressed out, worried about, be fearful. That's not that's a corruption that's in this world. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. But I want grace and peace to be multiplied me to me in the knowledge of Him. Go with me real quick to uh, Luke, Luke 2. <clears throat> Luke chapter 2, verse 15. And I went here last week, and I'm just again and, and, and getting names going this morning in today's message. This is a, this is a Christmas story. This is the Christmas message. Um, sorry, I think I uh, I meant verse 14, but that's, uh, we'll get there. Let's go back up a little bit. And this is a <coughs> Christmas story where the angels came and had met the shepherds in the field. And I want to back up again a little bit to verse 10. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, but behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Verse 11, Luke 2, 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards man. The angels sang when Jesus was born to the shepherds, they began to sing, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. And we spent time with this last week, but God has, has made peace with us. And I want to I want to uh, piggyback on that as we go forward this morning into not only our, our message on peace, but also our Easter message combined all in one. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 9. God is proclaiming that he has peace between God and man. 
peace and goodwill towards man. Are you following me? Okay. One thing about online, uh, doing it online, I can't see if you are saying amen or nodding or anything. So I'm going to be a little repetitive on that because I feed off the feedback. Uh, a teacher wants to know if, there's, if, their, if their listeners are listening <laughs> and uh, how they're getting it. I, it's hard for me to go on to the next point if you haven't got the point I just made. <laughs> that makes sense? But anyway, so bear with me. He says, For unto us, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This is a Christmas message, but it ties into the Easter message. For unto us. Unto who? Us. Are you us? Am I us? We, it's us. For unto us a child is born. Unto who? Us. A Savior is is given. See the past tense language? This child is born. Is given. And who is it given to? Us. And the government will be upon his shoulders. This child, this son has been given to us and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of who? Peace. And the increase of his government and what? Peace. There shall be no end. This child, this child of the angel saying about on that Christmas morn, is saying that this child, the government will be upon his shoulder, and the government, the increase of his government and peace. See, it's not just the government and peace, but there's an increase of government peace that will be upon his shoulders, and it will not come to an end. And this child, this child who has this government of peace being increased, and his life is given to who? Us. This child has been given to us in the increase of his government. There shall be, in peace, there shall be no man in. My peace is not based on the government of this state, on the government of this country. I, will, I, I, I honor the office and I honor uh, our president, our governors and, and whatnot. At the same point in time, the government is upon God's shoulders. And his shoulders, and this child, this son, has been given to me, and has been given to you. That makes sense. Okay? Go with me real quick to Isaiah 53. Now we're going to transition to the Easter message. Isaiah 53. And we'll pick it up in verse 4. How many of you know that Jesus was born to die? He was born to die for you and for me. I love this message here in Isaiah. It says, surely he has borne our griefs. Do you know the past tense language? Surely he has borne our griefs. And carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are, or as Peter says, we were healed. I'm not so much teaching on healing this morning, although it applies, but I want to uh, tie in and uh, or focus in on this phrase here in the mis middle of all this, that not only was he wounded for our transgression, not only was he, he when he bruised for our iniquities, and not only by his stripes were we healed, we usually focus on those guys. That makes sense? But we don't always focus on this middle part where it says, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. Jesus went to the cross. Jesus was born so that we could have peace with God. So that we could have peace in this life. There, you know, when Adam and Eve were created, there was no sin. There was no sickness. There was no strife and relationship uh, quarrels. There was no, there was no divorce. There was no, there was no evil. But through the sin of Adam, man was cursed. His seed was cursed. We were cursed as flesh and blood, as the human race. 
But it says in Galatians chapter 3 that Christ has redeemed us from the curse. And Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. Are you seeing a, a common thread in the, even the verses that we read this morning about this child that was born unto us and the government and, uh, on, that's on his shoulder is the increase of government and peace will come to no end. This child that the angels say of peace and goodwill towards man that this child was born to us for the chastisement for our peace shall be upon him. He has given us his peace. And we're going to expound on that as we go forward this morning. Well, how many of you know that Isaiah 54 follows Isaiah 53? We're in Isaiah 53. Well, let's scroll on down to Isaiah 54. Don't get dizzy on me as I scroll down. And we're going to, we're going to find verse 10. It's in the same context, really. Don't get, don't get all confused about chapters and verses. It's just a reference point. This is a scroll. This is a, a, a prophecy. Okay? The, uh, the chapters and verses were, were added later just as reference points. But Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10, this is what the writer writes. And actually, I want to pick up verse 9. And actually, this section right here, verse 10 especially, is really the keystone of this entire message. Okay? I've led Evan enough to come to this verse, and this verse we're going to unveil right here on our, our Easter morning. But verse 9 says, Boy, this is like the waters of Noah to me. God's speaking. And he's speaking to us, his people, his children. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so I have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. You know, this is very timely also for the day that we live in. With this coronavirus, with different things going on in the earth, God has sworn, not just by floodwaters, but God has sworn that he would not be angry with us and that he would not rebuke us. That is very strong. If God judges, I've heard it be said through the years, if God uh, doesn't judge America or judge our world, God will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I refute that. If God judges us, he will have to apologize to Jesus. Because the chastisement for our peace was on him. Not, not Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah lived in the Old Testament. We live in a better covenant. And the chastisement for our peace was upon Jesus Christ. And the proof that that chastisement was accepted, Jesus rose from the dead. And because he lives, we live. That makes sense. This is the cornerstone of what we believe in. But God, God says, God, I want to read this again. Uh, pick it up in verse, verse 9. For as I have sworn, God swore under by covenant that, that the waters of Noah would no longer come to the earth. He said, so I have sworn that I would, be, would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. Verse 10. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you. Before we go even further, God has sworn that his kindness towards you would not depart. In other words, God said, before the hills and the mountains depart, my, and, and, or let me say it this way, and, until the mountains and the hills depart, my kindness will not depart from you. And when we look out our window, there's mountains up there. And until the mountains are gone, that, that's why we love Alaska so much. There's a lot of mountains there. But until the mountains depart, my kindness will not depart from you. I don't know about you, but that's profound. I don't care what comes on this earth. Any I virus, anything, anything. But God has made a covenant with me. And that covenant says that his kindness will not depart from me before the mountains depart. 
That's awesome. You didn't even wonder why Sherry and I love mountains so much. We love it because we love cold. We love the climate. We love the mountains. But this is just all the more spiritual reason. God says, for the mountains shall depart and the hill be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you. Nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. I love this verse. This is just screaming out to me. God says that he has a covenant of peace. You know, we in the West, we in America, don't understand covenant very much, very well. People are not committed to many things. They're not committed to their jobs, their families, their marriages, uh, different things. People, we people are, will drop people like, um, I mean, uh, like there's no tomorrow. But God has made a covenant. It says in God's word that he honors his word above his own name. God says right here in this verse, the mountains will be removed, but my covenant of peace, my covenant of kindness will not depart from you. Does that, that make sense to you? I am not afraid of any virus or anything because I have a covenant of peace with my God. But I trust Him. I trust His Word. And because I trust him, and I trust his word more than I trust any of you. I love you, but I trust God more. Let God be true and every man a liar. Either we believe God, believe his word, or we don't. And I believe God. And I am not afraid of this virus. I am not afraid. God did not give me a spirit of fear, but power and the love and sound mind. And we studied last week, last week, those who have been made perfect in love will cast out all fear. And those who fear have not been made perfect in love. I don't say that to hurt you. I don't say that to offend you. I say that because it's true. I say that to encourage you. I say that to exhort you. Get to know God. Get to know his love. Get to know his nature. Get to know his promises. Get to know him. This gospel that we preach. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to those who believe. To the Jew first and to also to the Greek. For the just, it goes on to say in verse 7. That the just shall live by his faith. We are righteous. We are justified. And I live by my faith in the living God who lives. Who died, who was born for me, who died, was buried, and has rose again. Praise God. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? As believers, as believers, we're believers. We believe. As believers, we have a covenant of peace with God. That's awesome. We can walk in a greater measure of His grace and a greater measure of His peace when we increase our knowledge of Him. And part of that knowledge of Him is knowing that we have a covenant of peace with our God. The mountains and hills will be removed before, before God removes His covenant of peace from us. I don't know about you, but that the song that re resounds in my head right now is Blessed Assurance. We have a blessed assurance because God has said that the, the, the mountains and the hills will be removed before my covenant of peace is removed from you. We titled this message, Being Established in His Peace. And I can be established in a God who has made a covenant of peace and a covenant of kindness with me. me. And He says, and this child who has been born to me, this son has been given to me. The chastisement for my peace has been on him. God has made peace and given peace and goodwill towards me through this child whose government, the increase of his government and of peace shall come, come to no end. In other words, until the mountains and hills are gone, we can be assured, church, that God's covenant of peace is still in effect. I want to say that again. I want you to hear me well. Until the mountains and the hills are gone, 
we can rest assured that God's covenant of peace is still in effect. I want to say that again. I can't hear you right now, so you're going to have to scream louder. Until the mountains and the hills are gone, we can rest assured that God's covenant of peace is still in effect. That's blessed assurance. That's awesome. And this is the peace the angels were proclaiming on that Christmas morning. But also notice with me, and I've already emphasized this, notice that God has also sworn to be kind to us. We're not just at peace with God, but He is kind towards us. He even ends it, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. You can't earn God's mercy. You can't earn God's grace. You can't even earn his covenant. He's made a covenant with himself. But he, we are benefactors. We are beneficiaries of his covenant of peace and kindness. But that's not how religion depicts God. Many religious people portray God as a mean God or as an angry God who has a short fuse. But this is not our Heavenly Father. This is not our God. Go with me uh, real quick to uh, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. We studied on this before, and uh, when we talked about being established in His love, and I'm going to refer to this a little bit later when we talk about our God being a good, good Father. Let I me mean, know we have a good, good Father. We'll probably get into this a little bit more next week. But behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. God has loved us. We need to behold. We need to behold this week. <coughs> behold means to see with the mind. We need to be focused on this. We need to gaze our focus on this truth. Our Father, how much our Father loves us. He loves us so much that He bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. He has made us children of God because of what Jesus did. Amen? He is the firstborn. He, he, he was... The firstborn. He was, Jesus is the firstborn of many brethren. We are children of God because of what Jesus did. We'll spend a little more time on that a little bit later. But go with me real quick to Exodus chapter 34. What I'm focused on right now, just kind of a little side trail. But religion depicts God as an angry God. But I want to defeat that with scripture. Go with me to Exodus 34. And I'm going to pick it up at verse 6. In Exodus 34, we are in the Exodus. Israel has already left Egypt. But they're on their journey to the promised land. Of course, they're wandering a little bit here. But there's a point where God is having a very intimate conversation with Moses. And Moses says, Lord, don't lead us unless your presence goes with us. I love that. There's some other aspects I can bring out of that, but I'm not teaching that right now. But Moses would ask, how, he's asking it, basically, let me just summarize this, he's asking to see God. He's asking God to show him his presence. And in Exodus, he did that in Exodus 33, but here in Exodus 34, God hides Moses in the cliff of the rock. And then he passes by Moses. And as he passes by Moses, God reveals himself. His nature to Moses. And this is what God says when he passes by Moses. And it says, verse 6, Exodus, Exodus 34, verse 6. And the Lord passed before him, Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Goes on to say, keeping mercy for thousands of thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions of sin goes on, and I'm not going to explain the rest of it right now. That's not, that's not the scope of my message this morning. 
I'm just making a little side note right here that many people portray God as an angry God, but even in the Old Testament, God reveals himself to Moses, who represents the law, that he is gracious, he's merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness <clears throat> and truth. That's who our God is. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. <clears throat> Go with me to John chapter 14. <clears throat> John chapter 14, we'll pick it up in verse 7. <clears throat> in my Bible, it calls it the Father revealed. And we're going to talk again more, talk more about the Father next week. Unless we get that far today in my, my teaching. Are you following me so far? I'm not going too fast for you. <clears throat> but John 14, now in John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. And he's spending a very intimate time with his disciples. <clears throat> and as Jesus is spending time with his disciples, Jesus is talking a lot about the Holy Spirit. And about going to the cross. But he also makes this very intimate statement in John chapter. He, John 17, he says, If you have known me, you have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, verse 9, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? You know, we need to see the Father. We started this whole series talking about grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Him. How many of you know that we need to get to know God? We need to know God. We need to know God. We need to know His attributes. We need to get to know His divine nature. Love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, etc. We need to get to know God. And this God, this child... This, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And this child, this Jesus, that has been given to us, this Jesus that has been, been given to us, been born unto us, and the cre increase of his government peace is on his shoulder, this Jesus who is chastised for our peace, among other things. We need to get to know him. And as we get to know him, his nature, beholding him, beholding him, Jesus, we get to know the Father. Jesus is gracious to us. Jesus is merciful to us. Jesus has forgiven us. Jesus has taken our sins, put it on Him, and crucified it. There is no greater love than this. We spent last week talking about this is love, not that we love Him, but that He loved us and became our propitiation. And when we're perfected in this love, we have boldness in the day of judgment, we have, why do we have boldness in the day of judgment? Because we know that he has already been judged for us. God is not light on sin. God is not sweeping sin under some carpet. God is not winking and ignoring sin. No, he brutally and fully judged our sins on Jesus. Amen. The chastisement for our peace was on Jesus. So that we can be righteous and peace with God. That's, that's the gospel. And if God judges us for the same reason he judged Jesus, then Jesus died in vain. And that's not the message we preach. Jesus was chastised for us. And his grace teaches us to deny godliness. His grace teaches us when we awake to his righteousness, we will sin not. We don't sin not by, by being righteous on our own merit. We become righteous by waking up to this righteousness we have received through Jesus Christ. And that revelation will teach us, will enable us not to sin. Walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It doesn't say control the flesh and you'll walk in the spirit. No, it says walk in the spirit first. And you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
We need Jesus. We need to walk. And the walking in the, and the, and what I just quoted, walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, is Galatians 5.16, which is just a few verses between, before Galatians 5, 22 and 23, which says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, etc. So walking in peace is prerequisite to not walking in the flesh. You walk in the Spirit first. And you walk it so you, you don't... And when it says you, so you, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, the word fulfill in the, in, the, in the Greek is the same word that Jesus said, it is finished. You won't finish. You won't complete. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh if you are walking in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit is love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, etc. Am I making sense, folks? We grow in peace, grace and peace in the knowledge of Him. Not in the knowledge of ourselves. Not in the knowledge of the coronavirus. Not in the knowledge of other things. We grow in peace in the knowledge of Him. I've said this last week, I've said this before, that we, will, we need to grow our faith and starve our fears. But a lot of us, and I say this in love, we are growing our fears and starving our faith. How do I know that? What are you feeding on? Are you feeding on Jesus, the bread of life, or are you feeding on the, on the news, which is the bread of sorrows? We don't have news in this house. We don't turn the news on. We have not listened to news, and we won't listen to news. We, I'm going to say this in love, but I hate the news. I don't like it. I do not like the news. One, it's not news. It's gossip, and most of it's lies. I say this in love, and a lot of you might not like that. But this, <laughs> I say it doesn't love, but this is my message. <laughs> this is my this is my Facebook post. And I'm saying I'm saying that to be political, I'm not saying that to be, but I'm proclaiming Jesus Christ is my Lord. I have a covenant of peace, I have a covenant of kindness. And my revelation comes from him. You know, if I wasn't gonna go here, but we had a good Bible study last night. Sherry and I, but it go would be to Ephesians chapter one. This is a freebie. I wasn't going to go here, but I'm just going to follow the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1. We'll pick it up in... Uh, we'll pick up verse 14. Well, I'll pick up verse 13. <laughs> I keep going backwards. In Him! Who? In Him! Jesus! God! You also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also having believed... You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance? Jesus is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Therefore I also, this is Paul speaking, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And this is Paul's prayer. There's a colon at the verse... 16, verse 17, praise this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Paul's prayer for you, church. Paul's prayer for me. Paul's prayer for us is that we don't have a spirit of fear, but we have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. In the knowledge of Him, that the eyes of our understanding be enlightened, that you may know what are the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ Jesus when He raised Him from the dead and seated him at the right hands in heavenly places. I can't read that without emotion. I can't read that without passion. This, this perfect way to the Easter message, talking about the same power that raised Christ in the dead, it lives in you. In the same power that raised Christ from the dead, lives in you. How can any coronavirus or anything else conquer the resurrection power of Jesus that is alive in you? 
That's powerful, folks. And how do we get this? Through the spirit of wisdom and revelation. We need a revelation of God. We need a revelation of the gospel. We need a revelation of Jesus. You know, on Facebook, I don't really want to talk about the virus. I don't want to talk about social distancing. I'm not disrespecting any of that. But I am here to magnify Jesus. The resurrection. And the key. My God, he's a resurrection in the life. He's a resurrection in the life, church. In these days, in this hour, in these end times. I'm here to rebuild Jesus. I want you to be established in peace. When you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation, you will have peace. Am I making sense? My prayer for you, my prayer for me, is the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened that you may know the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance? Folks, we have such an inheritance. I, I don't have time this morning to teach about everything about the inheritance. But one aspect of thy inheritance is the covenant of peace and kindness. One of those inheritance is having a revelation of him, a relationship with him. I'm not here teaching religion. I hate religion. I'm here teaching a relationship with God. I want you to have a revelation of the resurrection power of Jesus. Which he worked on Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, even the coronavirus. And not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he, Jesus, he, God, put all things. So speak that with me. All things. All things. Say it again. All things. All things. Say it again. All things. All things. God has put all things under his feet and gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church. The church is not closed. The church is filled with the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. The church is not close. The church is alive. The church is vibrant. The church is... The church is... Has, God has put all things underneath His feet, the church. And I don't know about you, and I'm not here teaching anatomy of man, but my feet are not underneath my head. They're underneath my body. They're part of the body. God has not just put under everything underneath the head. He said he's put everything underneath his feet. That includes the whole body. We are the body of Christ. Where two or more gather, there's a church. And I don't think we just have to gather physically. We can gather even socially through social media. Am I making any sense? He had... God has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of God, the fullness of him, who fills all and in all. The church is not closed. The church is Jesus. Are we not the body of Christ? Are we not the church of the living God? We're not dead. We're alive. We have been equipped for this. We have been trained for this. We have been empowered for this day. All my life I've gone to church. All my life I've been taught about the end times. All my life I've been taught different things. But Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus is not there. Jesus is not here. Jesus is here. He's within us. Individually, as a family, and collectively as a church. We are the body of Christ. And that of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. We are the church of the living God. I'm at peace because God is at peace with me. Because God is at peace with me, I can be at peace with you. 
It doesn't make any sense, folks. We have a covenant of peace. And my heart this morning, my heart in this message, is that we are established in His peace. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah sure has a lot to say about this. Isaiah chapter 26. Verse 3. And he says, you will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he, man, trusts in you. God will keep those in perfect peace, he whose mind is stayed on him. The moment I get my eyes off Jesus, and on the storm, on the coronavirus, on the news, on anything else, I step away from that peace. I'm not, I'm not boycotting news in and of itself. There's certain things I will. But I am boycotting that you have a con constant diet of the news and nothing else. I do rebuke that in the name of Jesus. That is unhealthy, that is unwise, and that will destroy you. I want the word of God, I want the knowledge of God to be my most dominant diet. I'm not anti-news in and of itself. We just don't have it in this house. I don't need that. I don't want that. I can get enough of the major headlines just scrolling through Facebook. Now, I don't know how much truth is some of that, but I get the gist. We don't listen to news and we know there's a coronavirus. We, we don't listen to news and we know there's a quarantine and we have to wear a mask and different things of that nature. I don't listen to the news, but we got the message. You know? We're living just fine. But you know one thing we are in this house? We are constantly in the Word of God. We are constantly in a relationship. We're not in, a, in the Word of God 24-7 in one sense, but we are meditating on His Word. We're speaking His Word. We're admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and, and spiritual songs. Also on Facebook, text, phone calls, different things. Listening to messages, listening to music, listening to worship. Be in the church. It's just awesome. Because he will keep a perfect peace, he whose mind is stayed on him, because he trusts in him. I trust him. I don't trust the news. I don't trust things. There's some people I trust, some people I don't. I'm not going to get political on some that. There's some, there's some, uh, some members of our government I do trust, and there's some I don't trust. I respect the office, but I trust God. That makes sense. Is that making sense? I, I want to I wanna be in perfect peace. How many of you want to be in perfect peace? Then keep your mind stayed on Him. The battle is in the mind. Keep your mind stayed, focused, fixed, dominated by Him. I don't, want, I don't mind listening to the news a little bit, but I'm not going to be dominated by that. I'm going to be dominated by God. And if what I hear, or even what I experience, doesn't line up to the Word of God, guess who has to change? God's not going to change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If my circumstance, my situation, or what I'm hearing doesn't line up, then it must line up and bow to the name of Jesus for the increase of His government and peace. There shall be no end. And the government will be is on His shoulders, and this this is God, and this child, the Son, has been given to me. God has put all things underneath my feet, and He has been chastised for my peace. It is awesome, folks. This is what Easter is all about. This is what the resurrection is all about. Not only did He take my sin, praise God. And that is. I mean, we can talk all day, all month, all year, all our lives about that. But because there is no curse, we are at peace with God. God has redeemed me from the curse. I have in my notes, we have a covenant of peace, yet many of us do not experience this because our minds are not stayed on Him. We have a covenant of peace. You have the same covenant of peace that I have. 
But the difference is, who are, is, our, is your mind, is my mind stayed on Him? We're only going to benefit, we're only going to participate, we're only going to experience the benefit of that covenant of peace and kindness if our sta mind is stayed upon Him. Am I making sense? We need to be stayed on Him. Walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Peace is multiplied to us in the knowledge of God. How do you get the knowledge of God? You don't get the knowledge of God by osmosis, folks. You don't get the knowledge of God just by, you know, uh, I mean, me mere meditation. You meditate on what you know. I read the God. I spend time with the Word of God. And then I meditate. I mutter over. I study. I focus. I meditate on what I know. I can't meditate on what I don't know. I can't meditate on repairing a car. I don't know how to repair a car. I don't care about repairing a car. I can't meditate on that. There's certain occupations I can't meditate. There's certain things I can't meditate. I don't know. I can't meditate on sports because I don't really know anything about sports anymore. I used to. I used to meditate on it all the time, but I don't know anymore. I'm not anti-sports. I just don't have time for it. I don't have the desire for it. I don't have an appetite for it anymore. I'm not anti it. I just, I don't, I have other things I'm doing. Am I making sense? He says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind stayed upon you. Peace is multiplied to us in the knowledge of him. Go with me real quick. Go, back, uh, go with me back to John 14. John 14. Where scroll down to me to verse 27. Same context we were in just a minute ago. Where Jesus was talking to the disciples of Philip. Again, this Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. And Jesus makes this statement to his disciples. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I want to read that again. Peace, Jesus is speaking to you. Jesus is speaking to us. But specifically, he's speaking to disciples before he goes to the cross. He says, Peace I leave with you. <coughs> My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Is your heart troubled? Is your heart afraid? Or have, let me say it this way. Has your heart ever been troubled? Or has it ever been afraid? Maybe you're not afraid about the coronavirus, but you've been afraid about other things. Some of you, because of the, the effects of the coronavirus, you've lost your job. You're afraid. Your heart's troubled. Maybe some of you have cancer or something else. Maybe you have a divorce or, or there's another illness. Maybe your loved one's in the hospital and you can't go see them. There's a lot of different aspects of this. Your heart's troubled. Your heart's afraid. Maybe you're in the hospital, you're listening to this, and you can't, you, you know, there's a lot of different things that are going on right <laughs> now. <coughs> Excuse me. But the, you know, let not your heart be troubled, let it not be afraid. Because Jesus says, My peace I leave with you. I gotta come back to that phrase or that word, I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, I give to you. It's his peace. And he says, I leave with you. First of all, let me just share this. The word peace here. And the word peace, and I should have said this earlier, the word peace, and we, right now we're in, we're in the Greek, but in the New Testament, but in the, the peace that we're talking about earlier was his covenant of peace. Is a, in, the, in the Hebrew, the word peace is shalom. And this word shalom in the Hebrew, it, it, it had a very deep definition. The word shalom, the word peace in the Hebrew, I should have shared this earlier when we were in, more in Isaiah. But the word shalom means completeness. It means safety. It means soundness in the body. It means welfare. It means health. It means prosperity or provision. It means peace. It means quietness, tranquility. It means contentment. It means peace in relationships. 
peace with God, especially in covenant relationships. It means also peace with war. There's many attributes of the shalom, but it means completeness. It means safety. And God says, I leave you with my peace. I leave you with my tranquility and quietness and contentment. I leave you with my peace. See, the night before Jesus died, he gave him his, his peace to his disciples. The moment you and I receive Jesus, every blessing that you will ever need, or that we will ever need pertaining to life and godliness is already inside us. And we already have access to it in the knowledge of Him. God has filled us with His fullness. It says in John 1.16, of His fullness we have received in grace for grace. We read it last week in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. It says, when we know his love, his love that surpasses knowledge, we will be filled with the very fullness of God. We read it this morning out of Ephesians chapter 1, that God has put all things underneath his feet, including the church, and he has filled us, <clears throat> he has filled us with himself. He is our all in all, it says in Ephesians 1, 23. We have the fullness of God. We have the fullness of God. We have Christ in us, the hope of glory. We don't just have healing, we have the healer. We don't just have provision, we have the provider. We don't just have wisdom, we have the God of all wisdom. We have the Savior. We have our Redeemer. We have everything we need. We have the God of peace. We have the Prince of peace. In the increase of his government peace, there shall be no end, because this child, this son, has been given to us. It has been, it's been given to us. It has been born unto us. And the moment you receive Jesus, you have received everything he has for you. In other words, God says, and we're going to get into this a little bit later next week. I don't think I'll get there today. But it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What's the kingdom of God? And we've already been teaching on this already in the series that the kingdom of God is not here. The kingdom of God is not there. But the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus said in Luke that, that it's to my Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. We have a good, good Father. And our Father's pleasure has given you, has given me the kingdom. And Paul says in Romans chapter 10 verse 17 that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God, church, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We're talking about peace. In my next series, we're going to talk about joy. And if we have the kingdom of God, and we're seeking first the kingdom of God, and his, the kingdom, his kingdom is a kingdom of peace. His kingdom is a kingdom of joy. And if you know me, if you've been around this church long enough, we teach righteousness not like, it, like, like there's no tomorrow. We just finished a series on being established in righteousness. And I'm not going to hash that all out right now. We're right with God. We're at peace with God because of Jesus. And because we have Jesus, because we're right with God, because he took our sins and he rose from the dead, we are the church of the living God, no matter what's going on in the world, should have peace and we should have joy. And Jesus says, I leave you with my peace. <coughs> See, a troubled heart, let me just say this first. Have we not, church, been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son? We're not of the kingdom of darkness. We are the kingdom of his dear son. See, a troubled heart and a fearful heart Work, or, you know, they work like a garden hose. Hands clamped down on the garden hose. Have you ever uh, clamped a water hose so the water's not coming out? Have you ever done that? But sometimes a, a troubled heart is like uh, fingers are clamped down on the water hose. The, su the supply is there. The supply is flowing. But very little or nothing's coming out. 
See, grace and peace is always flowing to us. We have a covenant of peace with God. We have a covenant of kindness with God. We, have a, we can come to His throne of grace and receive mercy in our time of need. God will never leave us or forsake us. He's always with us. We can be a perfect peace if our mind has stayed upon us. Of the increase of His government peace, there shall be no end. But sometimes a troubled heart because we're focused on the wrong thing. Sometimes because we're feeding on the sorrows of this world. Sometimes because we're so focused on what's going wrong. We're so focused on the pain. We're so focused on the lack. We're so focused on different things. We have a troubled heart. But we will get peace when we get our minds off our problems and our, our the circumstances and get our eyes on Jesus. The, the, the supply, the peace is there. But we can't experience it until we, like the hose, we release it and put our minds on Him. We can't see it. We can't experience it with our, when our hearts are so gripped with fear. We must release the water hose. We must release. And trying to figure out, trying to fix it on our own and get our eyes on Jesus. Back, back to John 17, I mean John 14 real quick. It says, peace I leave with you. I talk about the shalom peace. But he also says, this peace I leave with you. And if you study that word out, it means it's the same word for bequeathed. The way a, a, a rich man may bequeath his estate to his family or so, to someone else. Jesus has bequeathed us with his peace. I love that. <clears throat> to me, that's just very intimate. That, that's just very awesome. That God has bequeathed us with his shalom peace. Let not your heart be troubled, now to be afraid. Church, we don't have to labor and toil to experience the blessings. We don't have to be worried and fretful. We don't have to have each. Our heart doesn't have to be troubled. Our heart, why? Because he's been chastised for our peace. Not just because of our sins, but he removed. He removed all the curses. We, we, we were alienated from the life of God because of sin. But God has took our sin crucified our sin and we're now the righteous of God. See, fear has tormented. We're not tormented by fear. We have been made perfect by His love. We have been made perfect by His peace. And one of the ways that really resounds in my heart is this verse that we read from Isaiah 54 verse 10. That until that mountains and the hills are removed, God's peace for us will, will remain. Now I'm paraphrasing that, but we have a covenant of peace with God. And that covenant is in full effect until the mountains and the hills are removed. That's awesome. And actually he doesn't even say until the mountains and hills are removed. He says even, even if the mountains and the hills are removed, God, we still have a covenant with peace. In other words, our, our covenant of peace with God is everlasting. There's no end. Because he says an increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. I'm going to wrap this up here this morning. But because we have a covenant of peace with God through His grace, or by His grace, God has bequeathed us with His peace. In other words, God has bequeathed us with His shalom peace. God has bequeathed us with His completeness. God has bequeathed us with safety and protection. God has bequeathed us with soundness and welfare. God has bequeathed us with health and prosperity. God has be bequeathed us with peace and quietness, tranquility and contentness. God has bequeathed us with this peace. Is this making church sense, folks? It's a very simple message, but a very powerful message. But if you're struggling, your heart's still troubled, and you're saying, Pastor, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. And theologically and theoretically, I agree with you, but I'm still struggling. I'm still struggling. I understand. I've been there. Believe me, I've been there. There have been times I teach this, preach this, and then I, I'm there crying like a crybaby, worried about things myself. Because in that moment, I got my eyes off Jesus. I got my eyes on the storm. I've done that. The problem's not God. The problem's not 
and you went out to follow me. And uh, you might be saying, Pastor, are you saying to follow me? Well, I love you, but yeah. I don't say that to scare you. I don't say that to condemn you. I don't say that to be mean. But the problem's not God. The problem's not His Word. The problem is not the Holy Spirit. The problem is not Him. The problem is us. We need to get our eyes off certain things. We need to get our. We need to have a different diet, and we need to know to know God, and we need to trust Him. We need to believe Him. We need to walk in Him. He said He will keep you in perfect peace. He is mine to stay the place. God's true. I understand it might be a process. I understand it might be hard. But we don't do this by the flesh. We do this by the Spirit. And we're going to see this a little bit more when I get into my series on uh, the Spirit of Joy. It's, we don't do this by the flesh. We do this by the Spirit of God. Walk in the Spirit and will fulfill the lust of flesh. My focus, how do we do this? The, the question is always how. I hear what you're saying, but how do we do this? Get your mind focused on Him. Know Him. Grace and peace is, is multiplied to you in the knowledge of Him. What knowledge are you feeding your brain? Your mind stayed upon Him. You can't keep your mind stayed upon Him and listen to the news all day. That's, that's, that's an oxymoron. It doesn't work. In other words, I can't understand math if I'm, under, if I'm reading my ABCs every day. I'm only going to understand math if I study math. That makes sense. And even then, I might not understand that. I need a teacher. <laughs> I need a mentor. You know? But I just, you know, but, but you understand my point. Sometimes we don't understand scripture because we need a teacher. Not I'm not just talking about a pastor or whatnot, and that can help. But sometimes the Holy Spirit's our teacher. But we need someone to teach us. We need someone to explain it to us. But once they explain it to us, they can't walk it out for you. You have to walk it out. You have to focus on Him. You have to, but, and even then you can't do it by yourself. You need the help of the Holy Spirit. Peace is the fruit of the Spirit. Peace is not the root of the Spirit. We're not the root. He's the root. He's the seed. Peace is the fruit of the Spirit. So keep your focus on Him. It, grace and peace is multiplied to you in the knowledge of Him. It's not multiplied to you because you're doing good stuff. I'm not talking about being a good Christian. I'm talking about being a fruitful one. There's a difference. I'm not just talking about doing good deeds. I'm not just talking about doing Christianity. I'm talking about being a Christian. There's a difference between doing Christian things, or Christ-like things, and being a Christian. That makes sense? Am I making sense? That, mean, maybe that doesn't make sense. I'm not just a Christian because I go to church, read my Bible, and pray. I'm a Christian if not only do I read the saints, but I believe God. We're believers. We believe. We're Christ-like. That means Christ is in me. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I can't do these things in the flesh. I tried and fell and flopped down every time. It's Christ in me that enables me to have trust and peace in Him. But I need to let go of that water hose. I need to let go of different things. I need to go. Some of us need to shut off the TV. Some of us need to shut off Facebook. Now, yeah, let me finish my message. <laughs> you know, some of us need to shut off some things. You know, I, I, I admit, I'm not the guy who eats the veggies. I eat the meat, potatoes, and anything that has to do with sugar. I like those things, but I need to eat my veggies too. Sometimes I know I need, I need some orange juice. I need some fruits. I need some uh, other vitamins in me. I can't live. I'm not going to live good if I just eat junk food all day. That makes sense. I need to change my diet. Some of us need to change our diet. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Him. But I also believe that fear will also increase if, if the only, news, only information your knowledge you're feeding on is the knowledge of this world. That is not healthy, folks. You cannot... Be a peace and perfect peace if your mind is stayed upon the news or other things. You need to have time with God. You need to keep your focus on Him, not the sorrows of this world. Is that making sense? We're going to stay that a little more further next week as we talk about Him being our good, good Father. 
but he says, don't let your heart be troubled. How do we do that? <coughs> we need to keep our eyes stayed on that We have a covenant of peace with God. We don't have to do anything to earn his covenant of peace. We don't have to do anything to acquire his covenant of peace. It's already ours. But we do need to do something to walk in it, to experience it. And that is to keep our minds stayed up on him, to believe it, to receive it, to live it. Am I making sense? I'm not just a Christian because I'm born again. That's, that's where it starts. I want to live out this Christianity. I'm not a Christian because, you know, I'm not a Christian because I go to church any more than uh, I'm a Big Mac because I go to McDonald's. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Reading your Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior makes you a Christian. But now that he's in you, live like him. And how did Jesus live? He lived in peace. He slept in the middle of a boat in the middle of the storm. You know, as a child, as growing up, I used to hear that story, read that story, when the, when the disciples were out on the boat, and then Jesus sleeping on the bottom of the, on the bottom of the boat, and I'm like, how rude! <laughs> and then, come on! If you're going to be part of this, this ship, you're going to be part of this boat, be a team worker, why are you sleeping while everyone else is working? That's the way I thought it. It's like, how rude! I get it that he's at peace, but hey, why are you sleeping on a job? Who made, I mean, in one sense of the word, who made you king? I mean, he is the king, I understand that, but, but you understand, as a child, I'm just processing this. But now as an adult, as I understand it, he's sleeping because he's a perfect peace. And it's a very powerful story. And with just one word, he rebuked the storm, rebuked the waves, and there was peace. And after he made peace, then he rebuked his disciples and Taught them a lesson. But he didn't rebuke them and condemning them. He just re, he just reproved them. There's a difference between that. Does that make sense? All scripture is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so the man of God might be fully equipped for every good work. Sometimes we need to be reproved. Sometimes we need to change things. And in the midst of all this uh, being locked down and coronavirus and everything else, we have plenty of time. We have plenty of time. To keep our focus on him and not, not anything else. You know, some of us are bored sick with cabin fever coming out of our ears. We need to keep we need to keep keep our we need to be occupied. We need to be occupied. Keep your mind occupied on him. Even during this season, a very unique season that we're in. Keep your mind focused on him. But even when everything's going well, even when you get back into the, the run of life and, and everything else. Keep your focus on Him. That makes sense. And that's, that, that's the secret. Lord, we worship you. I can say this left and right, and there's so much more I want to say. But I just speak to your peace over all of our lives. Our emotions, our bodies, our finances, our families, our relationships. Lord, I understand there's some that are just out of peace. For your word says, how beautiful are the mountains of the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I proclaim peace. I proclaim peace in our country, in our world. I proclaim peace over this coronavirus. I proclaim peace over every fear and every troubled heart. I speak peace. And I also, your word also says we can proclaim salvation. I proclaim wholeness, healing, prosperity, that's what, that's what the word salvation means. Over every life, over every family, over everybody that's been affected in one way, shape, or form by this whole epidemic. And I speak peace in the name of Jesus. Peace be still. Church, let us be still and know that he's God. Lord, we thank you that you can help us to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Thank you for your covenant of peace. Thank you for your kindness that will never come to an end. Thank you for the increase of your government of peace on our lives. We worship you. We magnify you. Thank you that you died and you rose again. That we can have full assurance of our faith. In Jesus' name we give you thanks. 
Amen and amen. amen. God bless you. We'll see you tonight, 6 o'clock. Same time, I mean, not same time, 6 o'clock. The same channel right here on Facebook Live. All right, God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you tonight.